In this episode, we talk about an emerging trend of appointing an acting director general of police instead of selecting an eligible candidate for the post. We also talk about Akhilesh Yadav's claims of not getting invited to the UP leg of the Bharat Jodo Yatra. But first, we talk about the arrest of Jharkhand's former Chief Minister Heman Soren. Hi, I'm Rahel Filipos, and you're listening to Three Things, the Indian Express News Show. Over the last week, the state of Jharkhand witnessed some massive political upheavals. Most significantly, senior Jharkhand Mukti Morcha leader Heman Soren stepped down as the state's chief minister just moments before he was arrested by the enforcement directorate in connection with a money laundering case. And soon after, a new chief minister was sworn in, his longtime loyalist Champai Soren. Now, Heman's arrest was long in the making. The ED had been sending regular summons to Soren, but he had repeatedly refused to appear before the agency. He did, however, finally appear before the agency last Wednesday after a brief disappearance and was questioned for more than seven hours. The ED has alleged that Soren is involved in a 600 crore rupee land scam and a laundering of its proceeds. This was not Heyman's first run-in with investigation agencies. He has been accused of corruption in multiple cases and every time he has insisted these are part of a political conspiracy to destabilize his Jharkhand government. In this segment, the Indian Express's Abhishek Angad, who reports from Jharkhand for the paper, joins us to talk about the allegations against Surin, his eventual arrest and the larger political repercussions this could have. Okay, so Abhishek, what are the allegations against Surin and why was he arrested? Uh, yeah, so the Enforcement Directorate uh, who's been investigating the case, they've said that Heman Sorin is involved in the large land mafia syndicate that operates in Jharkhand and which basically falsifies records. And after falsification of records, they change the ownership of those land parcel and sell it to people illegally. So now at the center of this entire problem is one revenue tax inspector whose name is Bhanu Pratap Prashad. That gentleman, what he did was he had in possession of a large number of documents and large number of original registers where the original ownership of the lands of the people were present. So ED was investigating a separate case, a land parcel with the Indian Army, which was supposedly owned by some other person and somebody else claimed the ownership of that piece of land. And then in its investigation, ED found that all the records were forged. And that person which said there is a land mafia working. In that investigation, they got hold of this Mr. Bhanu Pratap Prashad. And Mr. Bhanu Pratap Prashad, since he belonged to the Jharkhand government employee, then another FIR was registered. It was from that FIR that some of the scheduled offense emanates from. And then the ED has taken a cue from that. And then they started investigating where... Mr. Heman Soren's name has popped up. While they were investigating and they got hold of the mobile phone of Mr. Bhanu Pratap Prashad, in that mobile phone, there were certain images. In those images are handwritten notes. In those handwritten notes, there were the mention of Mr. Heman Soren and a set of properties that he owned, which is to the tune of 8.5 acres of land. And he's saying, the ED is saying that it is through the proceeds of crime that these parcel of lands have been bought and been given to Mr. Heman Soren. And ED is saying that he's also part of a larger nexus who operates in the entire states taking away land illegally. Right. But how has Soren countered these allegations? Yeah. So this is what the ED is saying. But Heman Soren has been saying and for the longest time that look, there is no ownership of the land. And there is nothing which proves that I own that land legally or on paper. Because on paper, nothing is mentioned. Then the ED is countering to that and saying that since the ownership that the illegal position has already been there and that their survey has been done and the illegal position has been made allegedly by Mr. Heman Soren. This is what ED is saying. And in the due course, they also went to the site and they conducted their own survey and they found that it was indeed in the position of Mr. Heman Soren allegedly. Now, Mr. Heman Soren is saying in turn that this is all cooked up stories, forged documents. He has nothing to do with that parcel of land. Right. And there was a lot of drama in the run-up to his eventual arrest. Uh, Surin was summoned about 10 times and he only showed up for questioning twice. How has this case played out over the last year and a half? 
Yeah. So we need to go back two, three years in order to understand how the drama has been unfolding now and how it actually unfolded on the day when he was arrested. So two years back when he was called for questioning the first time, two, three years back, this was in, in relation to the illegal mining case in Sahibganj district of Jharkhand. There his aide, that is Pankaj Mishra, was already arrested, which the ED said that Mishra has been involved in doing illegal mining and his syndicate has been involved in doing illegal mining to the tune of 1200 crores. Now, this is a huge sum that's been mentioned. And for that reason, only Mr. Heyman Soren was called in for questioning. He went to the ED office and more than seven hours of questioning that had happened. And he gave all the records and he gave all the documents that was required. Now comes the army land scam and the following investigation in 2022-23. In that matter, what had happened is Mr. Heyman Soren was summoned for the first time a year back. Now, Mr. Heyman Soren's reply for the first time and uh, subsequently also has been on how he has already given all sort of documents that were required while he was being questioned in a legal mining case. So what else other information ED requires? Number one. Number two, now after this response, ED said that no, this is not what we require. This is in relation to other investigation related to proceeds of crime, which we need to investigate. But this has been going on to and fro for long. So out of 10 summons, Mr. Sorin paid heed to only two summons. So the first time that he appeared in the current case was after the eight summons were issued to him. So he called the ED officials to his residence on January 20 and he was questioned for more than seven hours. Between January 28th and 27, Heman Sorin received one more summon and he said that he will eventually get back to this. And then again, one summon he received to which he had responded, but we did not know till now. Now he goes to Delhi. In Delhi, he says that he has been doing some personal work and was there. Suddenly on January 29th, we come to know that the ED officials has have come to his home. We wouldn't call it raid raid, but it looked like a survey raid and they were just trying to find out where him and Sorian is, essentially. Now, in the same time, ED also claims that they have received one uh, cash of rupees 36 lakh from his residence. That's number one. Number two being a BMW car and the ownership which is it is being questioned and some documents related to the investigation of the illegal land dealings. Right. Around that time, there was a lot of talk about Heman Sorin having disappeared. Do we know where he went and when did he eventually reappear? Now, there's one theory which says that Heman Sorin travelled via road and came back to Jharkhand because he had an inkling that he might be arrested in this particular case and he wanted to go and meet the party members. He wanted to officially give the reins of the party to someone so that for a smooth functioning, otherwise his party would have been just on the verge of breaking away and the coalition. So he came back to Jharkhand and he popped up suddenly in the meeting and we were all shocked that when did he come and where did he come from? And then he held a meeting with the MLAs and the very next day, now the JMM started attacking ED and everyone saying that on January 28th, this week came to know on January 29th and January 30th subsequently, that January 28th, Mr. Shoren had written a letter to ED saying that I will be appearing before you. Please come on January 31st at my residence. On 31st, the ED arrived. There were prohibitory orders, hence nobody was allowed except from media. The questioning went on till seven and a half hours and a very interesting scene of events that had happened after that. So the questioning went on and then following the resignation and arrest. But this is why the drama was unfolded in this manner because CRPF on the previous occasion were booked and the Jharkhand police had repeatedly questioned the act of CRPF that what was the need for deployment when they were controlling the law and order situation. That's number one. Number two, there's this theory that's been propagated that ED wanted to arrest him in Delhi so that they were wanted to avoid certain law and order situation in Jharkhand. Number one. Number two. Number three, this is what Mr. Heman Shodin did not want it to happen and hence he traveled incognito. We still don't know how exactly he traveled. Did he go with, you know, via chartered flight to some destination and from there he came back to Jharkhand. We still don't know that. Right. But Abhishek, why did Sorin resign right before his arrest? Um, why not continue as chief minister? Now, one of the leaders or many leaders that I speak to say that he actually wanted to avoid any permutation or combination that 
could have occurred if you'd have been arrested while being the chief minister scenario number 1 being that the governor which is being alleged that the governor may or may not but there would have been a possibility where the opposition parties or other parties in the center may would have said you know this is a perfect situation to impose president's rule because then the entire state is in crisis and the sitting chief minister is in the jail so we really don't know how the state will be run and that the leaders are saying to me of the record is many people were taken aback because they thought that he'll not resign even after getting arrested Right and Abhishek you mentioned this meeting that Suryan had in Ranchi to identify his successor we know that there were multiple contenders in fact there was even some talk in between of Suryan's wife Kalpana becoming chief minister after his arrest why was Champai Suryan eventually selected So first of all there are multiple theories about why and when and then there are theories that uh, Basant Soren and Mr Hemant Soren had a argument before being getting arrested that Kalpana cannot become the CM somebody has to be from the family or other leaders but these are just uh, hearsay we don't know what actually happened but we know from various sources that I spoke and we'd also done an article on this and written an article on what was the problem and why a Champai Soren was chosen possibly because in order to avoid any kind of legal hurdle that the coalition government would have been pushed into by the governor and then further crisis would have set in now the second option with mr hemant soren was definitely mr champai soren because he is an old timer with the jmm and he is a loyalist of and an aide to sibu soren his father as well as he has been in winning elections from his seat in the last four times and he's also he was also recently matlab in the cabinet and he was a cabinet minister he had a welfare department and transport department as the portfolios so by making him the senior most that is he's a de facto the senior most leader in the jmm a soren averted two three another crisis number one there were certain detractors of soren within the party they would have stake claim they would have said that we don't recognize kalpana soren or we don't recognize x as our leader but with mr champai soren coming in nothing of that sort you know percolated the number second crisis the again averted was is with regards to sita soren sita soren is the sister in law of hemant soren and what we know is that there were reports coming out and then through sources that she was not happy with the fact that kalpana would be made the future cm of jharkhand with the arrest of mr hemant soren so he or mr basant soren that is his cm's brother being uh, in trouble in uh, having problem with all this arrangement as well so he technically avoided crisis which may would have arisen in his own family by the virtue of his being arrested by the ed so the safest bet for the gmm was to make champai soren the next leader of legislature party hence the cm right and abhishek is soren considered a popular leader um, how do you think his arrest will impact his image in the state yeah so heman soren has been pushed to the wall since 2022 when for the first time a uh, former chief minister raghuvar das he actually brought to notice to the public that look hemant soren being a minister of mines being a minister of environment owned a mine got a lease for himself and then got an environment clearance also since then there has been a crisis that has followed and there were certain labels and uh, you know monikers that was used for soren that is corrupt and his father was also like that but eventually when we read through it and we say ki if it's office for profit or not whether or not hemant soren should have gotten that lease eventually what we came to know was at best it was in conflict of interest but whether or not it was illegal we still don't have any decision to it but it has been argued that it was not illegal now even after the this huge crisis came in and every day we used to hear that hemant soren will be arrested or disqualified or his government is going to go down every time something would have happened he used to come out of that crisis so when he was pushed to wall he was able to convert those crises into some kind of opportunity to come out of it so hemant soren started becoming popular in the face of bjp polarizing on religious lines hemant soren started polarizing on moolwasi adivasis versus outsiders that is insiders versus outsiders so he became popular especially among the tribal communities in jharkhand and now that he's been arrested there is kind of a mixed sentiment when i speak to the people in the city let's say if i would speak to people from the tribal community in the city they are in a fix saying that it's good that he was arrested some say uh, may or may not would have been arrested or some say that they didn't want him to be arrested because whatever reason but in the village in the countryside in the rural areas certainly people are not happy 
with this arrest. Obviously, this will have an effect electorally, but whether GMM or the Congress alliance, which is intact as of now, will benefit from it or the BJP will benefit from it, this is yet to be seen. And next, we talk about the appointment of acting DGPs in Indian states. Last Wednesday, the Uttar Pradesh government appointed Director General Prashant Kumar as the Acting Director General of Police or the Acting DGP. Kumar is the fourth acting DGP in the state. And this is worth noting because a trend seems to have emerged lately in seven states and one union territory of appointing acting DGPs. Basically, instead of selecting an eligible candidate, These appointments typically involve assigning additional responsibilities of a police chief's post to a DG rank officer in the state. To understand why this is happening and the concerns it raises, my colleague Niharika Nanda speaks to the Indian Express's Deeptiman Tewari in this segment. So Deeptiman, can we begin by discussing what is the role of a Director General of Police? Look, the Director General of Police is basically the chief of the police force of any state. So basically, he determines how the policing is to be conducted in the state, how the law and order situation, you know, has to be maintained in the state. He's responsible for almost everything as far as policing is concerned in the state. So that's precisely the, you know, how criminal investigation is to be conducted, how VIP movement is to be regulated, how traffic is regulated. He's basically in charge of almost everything that happens as far as policing is concerned in a state. Right. So why are we seeing this change in trend when it comes to the appointment of DGPs in certain states? So basically what we are seeing is that there is an increasing trend of, you know, having temporary DGPs, that is acting DGPs, or say we can call them ad hoc DGPs in a state or say a union territory. Currently, there are seven such states and one union territory. And these include UP, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Punjab. In these four states, there have been temporary DGPs functioning for more than a year. In other states such as West Bengal, the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir and Uttarakhand, in the past few months, you know, temporary DGPs have been appointed and they have not been regularized. So it's a matter of concern primarily because it falls foul with uh, the directions of the Supreme Court. Right. And tell us what has the Supreme Court said about how DGPs are supposed to be appointed? Talk to us a little about the procedure in place. So, in the 2006 Prakash Singh case on police reforms, where the Supreme Court had given a fixed tenure of two years to the DGP and released some guidelines, some directions, and asked the Union Public Service Commission, based on the directions of the Supreme Court, to issue guidelines as to how the state police chiefs would be selected. And the idea was that there would be a seniority list drawn, and uh, you know, from that, the senior most officers would be recommended by the state to the UPSC. And from that, the UPSC based on a few criteria which included seniority, then a field experience and then their appraisal of how good they have been through their career. And based on that, three names would be given by the UPSC to the state government. And of those three names, the state government was supposed to choose one as the DGP of the state. So this was basically done by the Supreme Court to ensure that political influence in policing is lessened. So, because there is a process in place through which appointment is being made, so it will not be arbitrary. The political class will not just appoint anyone it likes or somebody who thinks that will tow its line. And because the DGP will have a fixed two-year tenure, so, you know, he will function independently. When we talk about policing, can you tell us how are the roles of an acting DGP different from that of a DGP itself? There is virtually no difference. The acting DGP will discharge the same duties that a regular DGP will. But the question is, will the acting DGP have the same independence that a regular DGP will have? Because an acting DGP will not have a fixed tenure of two years. So he can be removed any time at the whims and fancies of the government, of the executive. So the only difference is that he will not have the same independence. So he will constantly be on tenterhooks that I don't know when I may be removed. What if I do not follow these certain directions of the state government or the UT or whatever dispensation he is in? If I do not follow these directions, I may be removed. And uh, those directions may or may not fall foul with the law of the land 
or the spirit of the law. So that is why this entire petition of police reforms was filed in the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court guidelines and directions came precisely to grant independence to police chiefs. So like you mentioned that an officer is always on tenter hooks that he might be removed from his post of an acting DGP. So have we seen any such instances where an acting DGP was removed not because of his tenure coming to an end but because of some other reason? Forget acting DGPs. There have been DGPs who have been removed. That's besides the point. A regular DGPs who have been removed. I mean, UP is a case where Mukul Goyal was unceremoniously removed from his post by citing that uh, he is not interested in his work. It was quite embarrassing for the officer or for any officer it would be. He did not go to court or challenge it. He's quietly biding his time. He's still in service. But uh, there have been multiple examples because it is not binding on the state in any manner to actually give any reason for removing an acting DGP or a temporary DGP or somebody who is holding an additional charge because there are no such directions from the Supreme Court on temporary or ad hoc DGPs. In fact, the entire idea of ad hoc DGPs or temporary DGPs has been devised by the political class precisely to circumvent the Supreme Court directions and police reforms. Right. And Deepthiman, do we know the reason behind the rise in this trend of appointing acting DGPs, even though there is the availability of eligible candidates for the official post? Look, every state government or for that matter, even central government wants the police to be under its control completely. It's how the political class works. It's the culture of our nation, unfortunately, and Every state government wants full control over the police force. And because of this reason that petition was filed and Supreme Court directions came so that the police functioning is not manipulated by political considerations and that the rule of law reigns supreme. However, we all know that, you know, police powers are routinely misused either by policemen themselves or on the directions of governments. Who is to be arrested? Who is to be released? Who is to be given remission? We all know about such cases in recent past. So these powers are constantly misused. And it is to circumvent these police reforms, directions of the Supreme Court, that the states have started doing it. And were there any reasons given by the states that are appointing acting DGPs regarding why they are doing this? There are reasons given by states also as we spoke to many of them and they said that look at the end of the day it is the chief minister who has to run the state he is the best judge of how the state has to be run so the supreme court cannot decide as to who is going to be the dgp of a state by putting down you know a very ironclad process so the cm should have the discretion of how the state should be run how the state police should be run and that is why if there is no trust between the chief minister and the police chief, the entire process will go haywire. However, the fundamental issue with this formulation is that why is it necessary for the political class to have control over police in the first place? Why can't the institution of policing be strong enough to discharge its duties honestly? If the, you know a trained IPS officer cannot be trusted, to discharge the duties to the best of his ability. In what capacity should the political class be trusted to discharge the same duties through its directions? Now that you mentioned what the states have to say about this issue, do we also know what stance does the UPSC hold in this entire matter? Well, the UPSC is basically, as far as this matter is concerned, is largely a file pusher. So the problem is that UPSC has issued guidelines. On the basis of these guidelines, the states have to send proposals that, okay, these are the senior most officers. I am sending a list. You please send me three of the best from these names and then we will appoint a DG. So what is happening currently is that either states are not sending the proposals at all or the states are sending proposals with technical errors. So there is a consistent back and forth of files. So the process is not getting completed itself. So this is a problem which is happening for some time now and uh, the UPSC chairman even said that you know unless we get a proposal from the state or we get a proposal which is proper there's nothing we can do. And you said that this has been happening for a while so can you tell us exactly when it began? Actually this malaise began from the central government 
and uh, at the center where there are central police organizations such as the central armed paramilitary forces or uh, let's say national investigation agency the central bureau of investigation these organizations so we have seen a trend uh, under this government that the posts of chiefs are kept vacant for months on end and they happen regularly in the paramilitary forces there were times when itbp chief ss deswal would have additional charge of the crpf the bsf also so one person is having three three forces under them similarly crpf dg sl 1000 used to have two forces under him as additional charge then there was this case of national investigation agency country's premier counter terror investigation agency which is equated with the federal bureau of investigation in the usa that remained without a chief for almost a year with the additional charge of the agency given to this then crpf dg kuldeep singh so this has been happening at the center for quite some time and now it appears that everybody has understood it to be a good way to circumvent the supreme court directions in fact the former delhi cp mr sn shivastava remained temporary delhi cp for 2 years he was made a regular cp of delhi on the last day of his tenure that is a day before his retirement so the officer was on tenter hooks throughout his tenure and diptiman with this entire trend being on a rise what concerns does it raise regarding the criminal justice system and the country as a whole it does raise concerns in the sense that if the police is not independently functioning then we cannot really have a sense of unbiased criminal justice system it will be subservient to the political interests of the party which is ruling the state which is not the ideal thing to have so it will depend upon how righteous the ruling party is so depending upon how righteous and how just the ruling party is you know criminal justice system will be rolled out in the state so that is why it is problematic it also a statement that institutions are not important and what is important is the ruling elite or who is the person who is ruling the state so that is a, a very problematic situation in a democracy where there is a great emphasis and stress on building strong institutions that function independently that is why it is a problem and the other issue here is that interestingly even the supreme court has not taken great interest in picking up this issue on whose directions the police reforms process actually began for three and a half years there has been no hearing in the prakash singh judgment in the supreme court and only the supreme court would know exactly what are the reasons we don't know what are the reasons but it is the truth that no hearing has happened in the case and in the end we talk about rahul gandhi's bharat jodo nyay yatra Since Rahul Gandhi launched the second leg of his nationwide Bharat Jodo Yatra last month, he's run into a series of hurdles. Apart from some run-ins with the BJP in states like Assam, the party has also clashed with some of its India Alliance partners. The latest hurdle has emerged in Uttar Pradesh, where Samajwadi Party chief Akhilesh Yadav said that he has not been invited for the Uttar Pradesh leg of the Bharat Jodo Nyay Yatra yet. This isn't the first time an opposition leader has levied an allegation like this against the party. West Bengal Chief Minister Mamta Banerjee had also made a similar claim when the yatra was about to enter West Bengal. Speaking to reporters, Yadav on Saturday said, "The problem is that many big events take place, but we don't get an invite." मुश्किल तो ये है कि कई बड़े आयोजन होते हैं बड़े कार्यक्रम होते हैं हम लोगों को निमंत्रण ही नहीं मिलता तो अपने आप क्या मांगे हम निमंत्रण द कांग्रेस इज जयराम रमेश रिस्पॉन्डेड टू हिस्स कॉमेंट ऑन एक्स एंड सेट द यात्रा डिटेल्ड रूट एंड प्रोग्राम इन उत्तर प्रदेश विल बी शेयर विद इंडिया अलायंस कॉन्स्टिट्यूंट आफ्टर इट इज फाइनलाइज इन अ डे और टू एंड दैट अखिलेश यादव पार्टिसिपेशन इन द भारत जोड़ो न्याय यात्रा विल फर्दर स्ट्रेंग इन द इंडिया अलायंस The yatra is expected to enter UP in the afternoon of February 16th. The Congress party had recently come under fire from Mamta Banerjee who targeted the Rahul Gandhi led yatra saying it was only trying to give sursuri which is translated to creating a stir among Muslims in the state and suggesting that it was little more than a photo shoot. Banerjee had chosen to stay away from the yatra while it passed through West Bengal reiterating that she had been kept in the dark on the Rahul yatra through Bengal. 
The Bharat Jodo Yatra is currently traveling through Jharkhand and it saw the participation of newly elected Chief Minister and Jharkhand Mukti Morcha leader Champai Soren. GMM is also a constituent of the India Alliance. You were listening to Three Things by the Indian Express. Today's show was edited and mixed by Suresh Pawar. It was written and produced by me, Rahil Philippos, Niharika Nanda and Shashank Bhargav. If you like the show then do subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. You can also recommend the show to someone who you think will like it. Share it with a friend or someone in your family. It's the best way for people to get to know about us. You can also tweet us at @expresspodcast and write to us at podcast@indianexpress.com. At